Hello and welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm sorry about the break. It's been a minute. We're back though tonight on the verge of football season and more importantly on the verge of week zero. That's right. This one's all about Division Two football. Week zero, the first time that's been implemented in D2 football. And uh, some of these matchups we're talking about tonight are absolutely ludicrous. If you would have told people a year or two ago that these matchups were taking place anywhere inside of uh, one year's campaign or a season, they would have thought you were wild, let alone the first showing of the 2024 season. So that's what tonight's going to be all about. Welcome back. This is D1R 173 on the night of August 26th here. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo from D1 Rejects. And tonight we're talking all about D2 football week zero matchups. I hope you're excited about that one because I am. Some of these matchups are absolutely ridiculous. We'll get into all of that here very shortly. I try to do at least a good bit of research on my end to educate you guys who may not be familiar with all of these guys. But, uh, you know, finding info is hard. Very hard. You, you can tune into media days. You can watch different things. Try and pull stories. We'll talk about it. Try and uh, you know pick and see who I who I like in each of the matchups. But I, I'm not here to do game picks. Right. I'm just here to talk about these matchups. Get excited about it because that's easy to do. But as always, you can watch this episode on YouTube if you are. Don't forget about those timestamps bottom of the screen. Those video chapters. Listen pretty much anywhere else. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. Follow us on the socials. Trying to get this thing back up and moving as we get into the season. Want to have a lot of great coverage for you guys as we get rolling into football season. But uh, where to start? except for probably the most highly anticipated matchup in all of D2 football, at least this week. That's Ferris State at Pitt State. Ferris State, the Bulldogs, they're picked to win the GLIAC this year. Finished 8-3 and three last year in what was uh, ultimately, ridiculously, a disappointing season for the Bulldogs, the back-to-back uh, defending national champions. What a matchup this is going to be. And again, Ferris State to have three losses is a crime, I think, in their eyes, two of them being to their rival over there at uh, at Grand Valley. Grand Valley also defeating Pittsburgh State in the next round of the playoffs. Pitt State finished last year 11-2 and as co-MIAA champions down there with Central Missouri. So that's uh, going to be a big-time matchup between these two guys. And uh, Pitt was picked second in the MIAA poll. They've been giving Central Missouri a lot of respect down there. They deserve it, especially when you got a signal caller like Zagabrowski, excuse me, coming back under center for the Mules. But uh, Pitt has certainly earned a lot of their respect, and I was almost surprised by how high they've been ranked, not only in the MIAA preseason poll, but also all the different national recognition. When you lose a head coach and you lose some other big-time play caller or playmakers, I should say, uh, and some other guys that you lose to graduation, to still have that same level of respect shows what the coaches and the media alike think of this program and the respect they give them in order to have that confidence that they're going to be back year in and year out on the national stage. So Ferris, though, they return a lot. The same head coach, obviously, and he's still in charge over there. They're going to win football games as long as he's the head coach. The same quarterback in Golker. We got a glimpse of, uh, I believe his name is Trinidad last year. Brings a little bit of a different flair to that Ferris offense. Golker very much the workhorse that that Bulldog offense goes through that physical downhill style that suits him and that Ferris offense so well. They also bring back the linebacker, Connor Near after a stint at Oklahoma. We had him on the program a while back. The former D2 All-American is back wearing the black and red and yellow. They got some new uniforms down there, too, that look pretty nice. But he's back on that defense, which makes them even scarier on that side of the ball. They're going to be very stout at the line of scrimmage. But you know Pitt State is the same thing, right? Pitt State, though, they've got a quote-unquote, I use air quotes here, new head coach. And Tom Anthony, I believe his name is, who's previously on the staff. He stepped away from football, is my understanding, and then comes back now to be the head man in charge of this guerrilla squad. He uh, loses some playmakers. They followed the previous head coach uh, up to the Division I level. He took a... Another job there. They also graduate some key pieces. They're still going to be tough, though. I don't want to make it seem like they lost everyone. They're bringing back 13 starters, both sides of the ball there. Ten of those guys with all-conference MIAA honors, right, for Pitt State. So it's not like we've got a totally revamped a new roster coming into this one for Pitt State, which, by the way, home game for the Gorillas in the jungle, Carney Smith Stadium. Uh, I believe this is on the 31st, so it'll be the Saturday. And... This is a game that, like, right off the top of my head is, like, line of scrimmage. Man, this game is going to be ridiculously one inside of the tackles. And if you're Ferris State, I think they're just so excited. I mean, I have no idea. But from an outside perspective, I think Ferris State is so excited for this challenge. And of, like, Ferris State's MO for the longest time is, like, you know exactly what we're going to do. Good luck trying to stop it, right? Very much in the same sense we talk about Harding with their flex bone and kind of the way they run things. Ferris State certainly spreads the ball out quite a bit more. And they've got some more dynamic playmakers on the outside, you could argue. Uh, you know, maybe can compare to a team like Harding, but that style of downhill and that knowing what the opposition is going to run and like almost begging them or kind of uh, 
not begging, but daring them, I think is the right word, to try and stop what they know is already coming. That offensive line unit for Ferris is the unsung hero of those national championship teams, and being able to have that depth at that position and that unit is something that Ferris has kind of made their calling card in the last couple of years. Pittsburgh State very much kind of in that same realm. Uh, two different squads, two a little bit different styles of offense, but uh, when it comes to the line of scrimmage and comes to the physicality, these two teams match up incredibly well and incredibly even. So this is going to be a very fun one to watch. Would not expect this one to be a high score, especially in the first half. I think second half of this one starts to get a little unruly, gets a little crazy, and uh, it's week zero. Like, there's going to be MAs, missed assignments. There's going to be things that happen that you do not expect. Um, first half, expect a couple heavyweight punches and these teams trying to figure each other out. Nobody will be, like, sitting back and waiting. Like, these teams are both coming out and trying to deliver that first punch. So definitely expect for this to be a slugfest in the first half. I'm excited about that second half. I think things could get, like, unwound down there in Kansas and some some shit could go pretty haywire. But Fair State, Pitt State. Who knows? Um, maybe I'm a Gleat guy, but I kind of like Ferris State in this one, going on the road and just surprising people week one. But that Pitt State team has a ton, a ton to prove. But let's move on. We've got uh, another, I would say, almost equally, almost equally as big of a contest going on down at Northwest Missouri State. They're hosting the Mavericks from Minnesota State. And when you talk, we're talking MIAA, NSIC, a quote-unquote, once again, down year for Northwest Missouri State. They finished 7-4 and four last year in the MIAA, and, and they're uh, trying to earn their stripes back. And 7-4 uh, and four a year for a program like that is... Uh, so many teams would kill for that, right? Northwest, not one of those teams. They need to be at the top of the top. And for them not to be... In the conversation as conference champs last year, definitely hurt those guys, the Bearcats down there. Minnesota State coming off a playoff berth last year. They finished nine and three, had a solid season in the Northern Sun. They uh, they lead the all time series. The Mavericks do nine to eight. They're three and five on the road though, which is worth noting. The Bearcats have had success against the Mavericks at home. The last game between them was in 2012, and I do believe it was a double overtime type of contest. So that is pretty exciting. We talk about these two squads though. The one glaring piece that is a little odd about this, both these squads not only losing their leading rusher, they're losing to the portal, and they lose them to a D1 squad that comes and poaches them. How about Sheen Butler Lawson from the Mavericks? That's 1,450 yards and 15 touchdowns on the ground alone. He gets picked up by Indiana State. And then you go Jay Harris on the other side of things for the Bearcats. 1,400 yards, 14 touchdowns. Sound familiar? Just on the ground. He's actually at Oregon. And uh, I think I got some decent reps in their spring game. So we'll see what he does here with, uh, with the Ducks this season. You lose... Really, two of the biggest playmakers in the offensive backfield in all of Division II football. And so now these teams are both faced with this problem of not how do you replace them, but how do you replicate their production, right? We're going to talk a lot about that with guys uh, that aren't returning for these squads. But very interesting predicament that both these squads are in and trying to replicate that production. That is a lot of carries for both these squads. They have to go out and get someone to uh, to pick up the load there. Also, you look in the offensive backfield for the Bearcats. They lose Mike Hohen, see who we've had on the program a couple times here. Uh, love the man down there. But that means the Bearcat offense, they need some people to step up. They might need to uh, find a little bit of a new identity behind some new faces. They do have a, a good bit returning, but again, some of those big-time playmakers on the offensive side are going to... Uh, there's going to be some question marks in those spots, especially week zero. Now, they were picked third in the preseason poll behind UC and Pitt State, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then Mankato was picked third in the NSIC behind, I believe, Duluth and Augustana. So, two teams that uh, certainly have been given their respect, but have goals and aspirations for a lot more. Otherwise, on the news side of things, Mankato, they've got a new offensive quarter, a coordinator who was a former quarterback for the Mavericks. And uh, here I have the, the release right here. Ryan Schlicht, Schlicht the I'm sorry, brother. Sorry, I'll let y'all read it yourself. How about that? Go ahead and take a look. That's the new offensive coordinator for the Mavs uh, this year. And uh, they were excited about bringing in an alum. He's got a, a lot of experience at the Division II level as a coordinator. And um, recently, he was at Northern State. So he was coaching the wide receivers, then the quarterback, and then took over the offensive coordinator role uh, for the last uh, season or two, looked at the last two seasons there and had some good success with the Wolves. And uh, he was a four-year letter winner, three-year starting quarterback for the Mavericks, played in 50 games for Minnesota State, which is pretty sweet. And uh, went on three different playoff runs 
So a guy that has some great experience, obviously in the coaching realm at the D2 level as a coordinator, but also someone who played at the school he's coming back to. And uh, more importantly, had some great success there. So that's a big time addition for them. Looking at uh, some other news when it comes to this event, though, these two teams are doing something pretty cool uh, when it comes to honoring one of our friends of the show here. And that would be Brandon Meisner. Uh, you guys might know him as the man who is in charge of and runs D2Football.com and their Inside D2 Football show. Uh, he, uh, they got a helmet decal going on for him. He suffered a, a stroke uh, back in May, and uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, since still been trying to recover. And obviously, we've been we've been out, you know, had some outreach on Twitter and other social media, and, and wishing him the best. And the D two squad is going to continue their coverage, which we love to see. But uh, hoping the best for him. They've got a custom helmet decal uh, for Brandon that they'll be debuting for this game. That I should be able to pull up for you right here. This is the decal that these teams will be wearing on the back of their helmet to honor Brandon Meisner. And uh, there's a GoFundMe campaign that's been launched to assist Brandon and his family. So if you guys uh, would like, it's on the link. The link you go to d2football.com um, or their Twitter pages or even this Northwest has uh, has a link to it here. So that is a pretty cool a pretty cool deal that they're doing over there. I love to see those guys uh you know, you know, looking out for him and, and kind of honoring him in that way. He is still alive, by the way. He is still alive. So certainly keep him in your in your thoughts and prayers. But uh, some other notes on this. You talk about, this is a home game for the Bearcats, right, down at Northwest. Since the 2001 season, Northwest has gone 123-12 and 12 in Bearcat Stadium. That is outrageous. Eight of those 12 losses come against MIAA opponents. And... Uh, the four non-conference losses came against, one of them was Northern Colorado. Then you have Nebraska Omaha, Abilene Christian. Does that, anything sound familiar about these about these squads? None of them are Division II anymore, <laughs> right? And then Kingsville uh, was a 2010 season opener. But that is that is really ridiculous. 123-12 and 12 at home since the 2001 season. That's incredible. They also have 28 straight winning seasons. As, long as, as well as 12 consecutive season opening wins. So this is a squad that has, has had a lot of great success early in the year. Uh, you talk about them dominating the line of scrimmage as well. They were uh, number two in the nation in rush defense. And so we talked about trying to replicate the numbers from some of their, their backs when it comes to the offensive backfield. Their defense is going to step up to the test. So I'm excited to see this matchup. Uh, again, another physical one. Don't expect it to be a super high scorer, especially this early in the season, but I definitely would have the Bearcats taking the edge at home with their track record in that stadium and just everything that comes with that. Now, let's move over to another NSIC team, another playoff squad, Bemidji State, the Beavers. They've had three tri uh, straight trips, excuse me, to the second round, not just the playoffs, but to the second round of the NCAA playoffs. Michigan Tech, the Huskies, are traveling down to take on the Beavers. Tech finished a meager 5-5 five five last year in the GLIAC Beavers, 9-3 in the NSIC. Tech does lead the all-time series 10-5. The last game played between these two squads, 1992. The first of which, 1956. I, for one, did not realize this is a game and a contest and a battle that goes back and dates back that long. There hasn't been a game in, let's see, 12, 30-some uh, years. Quick math. That's awesome. What are the cliff notes for this one? For Michigan Tech, obviously, uh, Metlack and kind of the other uh, quote-unquote new additions of the coaching staff cementing themselves up there for the Huskies. But I think the biggest one for the Huskies when it comes to their offense in particular, Darius Willis. He's back for MTU, the former first-team all-GLIAC wide receiver. He went to UAB for 2023. He's returned to the Huskies. Talk about the Gleak and bringing back these D1 guys. Talked about Connor Muir earlier and now uh, D. Will, Darius Willis up there. In 2022, he led the Gleak in receiving touchdowns and yards. He's an honorable mention All American, a first team All Gleak wide receiver selection. That's a big time piece for them. Freeze looks to be the one under center for them, Alex Freeze, who's gotten some experience, um, but now will really be his time to uh, to come out. And obviously last year uh, you know, broke out and had some some big games, but now this is really time to, to take control of this offense, and we'll see what that Michigan Tech offense does. The defense we know for Michigan Tech is going to fly around and keep them in a lot of games, very similarly to Bemidji State, who might have not had an explosive offense for uh, a bit of the season. But uh, that offense for, for Michigan Tech might be a question mark, 
getting a big time playmaker like Darius Willis uh, back on that side is huge. They've got some other contributors on the outside there that I know they're really excited about, and, and a squad that really has a lot of upside uh, over there in the GLIAC. But Midgey, they scrimmaged Duluth this spring, which is interesting to me. And um, we talk about a rule in NCAA D2, at least, that hadn't been implemented prior, very similar to the Week 0 concept. The scrimmaging in the spring, other than like a COVID couple of deals that went on, that wasn't really a thing, right, before. And now, not only are you able to scrimmage in the spring, but they will be able to do it against a really talented in-conference foe for Bemidji State, a team that is picked to win the conference in Duluth. That was a great test for them in the spring. And a couple new faces on the offensive coaching staff. They got a new coach at the offensive line position and wide receiver group for the Beavers. But like I said, three trips to the second round of the NCAA playoffs. Don't count out the Beavs at home. This one is going to be really exciting. I think that comes down to uh, the fourth quarter there for either of those squads. I expect the over under. I mean, I'm putting at like 38, I think. And that might be, that might age like milk over under, let's say 38 and a half. Let's say 38 and a half for over under lock it in right now. Um, I don't sports bet this disclaimer. Uh, but let's move on. We've got, uh, looks like two, three more, four more matchups to talk about. Hell yeah. Uh, let's go on to the RMAC slash Lone Star. Colorado Mesa at Texas A&M Kingsville. The Javelina 7-3 last year. Mesa finishing at 6-5 and five in RMAC play. Javelinas lead this series 2-0. They won 30-10 to 10 last year. But uh, I want to talk about the Mavericks quite a bit here. They brought in 47 on National Signing Day this year. And don't get me wrong, they bring back uh, quite a bit of guys there and some depth. But you're going to have an overall young squad. When you bring in 47 people on National Signing Day, the the vast majority of them freshmen, that's... uh, that's a lot of young faces on a squad. Now, they're picking fourth in the RMAC poll, and I think the big question for them was at the quarterback position heading into, quote-unquote, week zero. Coaching staff, as of this past week, hadn't really made that official. The head coach said both Richardson and Omave, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correct, will play against Texas A&M Kingsville. So on the preliminary depth chart, though, Richardson is listed first. So expect him to start. Uh, Omave will, I'm assuming come in and get some reps as well. So could have a little bit of a two-quarterback deal going on for Mesa as they try to figure things out offensively for the Mavericks. They lose a big-time wide receiver in Keenan Brown, who had a little over 500 yards and four touchdowns last year, the transfer portal. He went to IUP to reunite with former quarterback uh, Carson Hunter over there and I believe just had a season-ending injury. So T's and P's to him. Hate to hear that. But uh, nonetheless, they lose some production out on the outside offensively. And uh, back to the Javelinas, picked fourth in the Lone Star preseason poll. They had four different quarterbacks start under center last year. The Javelinas did. For a team to have four different quarterbacks start and you finish seven and three, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? When I say that, what does that mean to you? That means your defense was balling out. Expect them to do very much do that again. Uh, assume Cannon Williams should be the starter going into week one, probably based on his name alone. Cannon Williams? Who knows? Who knows? If you're going to put money on it, which again, don't, but if you're going to put money on it, Cannon Williams, uh, I would probably pencil him in as a starter for uh, those guys heading into week zero. Could be a lot of mix-up and a lot of shake there at the quarterback position for the Javelinas, but excited to see how that one pans out. Now, the RMAC made quite the blunder on Twitter. Putting out a, uh, a tweet about the RMAC programs listed in the AFCA preseason poll. Take a look here. What do you notice? It says, quote, with the opening kickoff only four days away, this is a reminder that three RMAC programs were listed in the AFCA preseason top 25 poll. They have Mesa football at number five. Kobe, Mesa football isn't in the top 25. And I would say, I know. They're not. It's mines. They tagged the wrong fucking team. How is this tweet still up? I mean, they're getting cooked on here, too. I mean, what are we doing? Our Mac, what are we doing? Ah, uh, you know that's a tough look. Tough look from a, uh, an official conference count there. Uh, nonetheless, no disrespect to Mesa, they, they're definitely poised to have a solid year this year. They're picked behind Mines and uh, Western Colorado, I believe, and uh, CSU Pueblo, who we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, a lot of respect to be earned. Is all that means for for Mesa there. But uh, expect that Kingsville. I would I'd definitely give Kingsville the edge there, especially being that at home kind of contest for them. But let's move on. Another RMAC squad here. Two RMAC squads actually open things up at the conference game, which is wild. CSU Pueblo, Concordia, or Concordia. 
gosh. Colorado State, they finished 8-3 and three last year. They're heading down to Hard Rocker Stadium against South Dakota Mines, who was 5-6, and six, had a little bit of an off year last year. The Thunder Wolves, they lead this all-time series 7-0, also 4-0 and on the road. Uh, they won 35-28 last year, so it certainly wasn't a blowout, a one-score game for the Thunder Wolves. They were picked third in the RMAC poll, but no first-place votes for CSUP, right? The... Top being Mines, second being Western Colorado. Those two took all the first place votes. Nobody's taking the Thunder Wolves to uh, to go out and win the whole thing, but they are giving them their respect up at third there. South Dakota Mines, though, was picked sixth in the poll. Um, kind of expected to have kind of a mediocre season. The Wolves, though, they're bringing back 21 starters, more than 60 lettermen, but 21 starters on either side of the ball for Pueblo. That's an exciting one. Second year for Coach V. Hill and company. Some big stadium renovations, even though they're playing on the road. Some big stadium renovations, other things going on over there in the Thunder Bowl, I believe it is called. I hope I'm correct in that one. And uh, potentially most importantly, uh, Daniel Bone, still in that defensive secondary, still roaming out there somewhere. He's a threat. He is dangerous. He's going to light somebody up over the middle. He's going to come and make a takeaway. He's going to make a big-time play when you need him to make a big-time play. He's been doing that. It seems like for seven years for Pueblo, expect him to be doing a lot more of that in this game and throughout the entire course of the season. On the other side of things for the Hard Rockers, they got a new offensive coordinator who was previously an offensive analyst and assistant quarterback coach at Memphis, Ryan Freeman. That's an interesting non-lateral, but is it a technically a downward move? Because you're going from offensive analyst at a Division I, uh, a group of six that we're calling it now, to a coordinator level, but it's at a D2. That almost feels lateral. I don't know how that goes. Interesting move. Don't see a lot of that. Also have a new wide receiver coach over there for mines. The big test, though, in this one, and I think what this is kind of what determines the game, South Dakota mines, can they stop the pass? Their run defense in 2023 was one of the best in the conference. But the Wolves, they didn't really hurt you on the ground and pound. They hurt you through the air last year. If they can replicate that, that'll be the biggest test for Mines. Uh, we know they can stop the run, but if you can't stop the pass, this, uh, this Pueblo offense is going to go all over you. On the road, I'm giving Pueblo the edge there. I definitely I think I would take them, but who knows? All up in the air. All right, let's go on for some PSAC action, and we'll uh, finish it up with a pretty exciting matchup. East Stroudsburg at Edinburgh to kick things off this year in the PSAC. The Warriors from ESU coming off a playoff berth last year in 2023. They lead the all-time series 10-5, and five, although they're only a measly 3-4 and four on the road. The last game was back in 2019, so these two teams have not squared off in quite a few years. Warriors picked third in the PSAC preseason poll. Last year, talk about that playoff berth coming off in 2023, that was the first one since 2009 for the Warriors. That seems like a big-time accomplishment and definitely a piece to consider going into this one. The Warriors, they dominate the line of scrimmage. They had the best rushing defense in the PSAC last year, a top-three rushing attack. Edinburgh, close to last in both of those statistical categories when it comes to conference rankings. So... This one could be a bloodbath. I'll put it out just like that. New defensive backs coach and offensive coordinator for Edinburgh. So new pieces over there. We'll see if it takes a little bit to adjust to that. Or maybe they've got a new scheme in place. And they can get some things dialed up on that side for the Scots. I think this is a bloodbath. East Stroudsburg writes that road record. Goes into Edinburgh. Gets a big time dub. Let's finish things out here though. With I think a really kind of... Uh, unorthodox matchup, and I say that because this is the first ever meeting between these two squads, at least as far as I can tell in the history of these two programs. How about Delta State going into Mars Hill? Some uh, Gulf South and Southern Athletic Conference action. Delta State obviously coming off a playoff berth. 10-2 and two last year. Mars Hill 8-2 and two last year. Two squads have seen a lot of success. Like I said, the first ever meeting between these two teams. Big question mark for the Statesman. How the hell do you replicate the productivity of Patrick Shegog, one of the best players in the state last year, uh, probably the winningest quarterback in Delta State history? I don't fact check me on that. I'm just guessing. The dude won a lot of big time football games, made a lot of big time plays for them. How do you make that up? The senior Cole Kirk, he's expected to start, but the tra they got a transfer from Southern Miss in Jake Lange. He can certainly compete for that spot. Again, though, that senior Cole Kirk has been with the program for quite some time now. Uh, you got to imagine he's very comfortable with that system, has been around it for a long time, knows those guys, has great chemistry. Expect him to be under center for the Statesman. Things can obviously change uh, one snap at a time. Now, for the Statesman, they got a senior wide receiver on the outside as well, and Jalen May, he's on the Reese Senior Bowl watch list. Also have an offensive line 
lineman and a running back on the D2 Football Elite 100. So this offense has talent across the board, and I think for a quarterback, not that uh, Kirk or Lange are stepping into this spot or, or, or Green not necessarily. They're both, I think, technically seniors. But for a quarterback coming in and assuming this quote-unquote starting role and the reins to an offense to have some talented pieces around you and some talented pieces in front protecting you, that's big time for Delta State. Feels very good for them. Mars Hill picked fourth in the sack preseason poll. Feels low for them, but they did get two first-place votes, right? So the sack preseason poll, if I'm remembering correctly, Lenore Ryan picked first. Makes a lot of sense coming off last year. They got a lot of pieces coming back. Wingate, second. Makes a lot of sense. Limestone, third. And then Mars Hill, fourth. But Limestone didn't have any first-place votes. Mars Hill gets two first-place votes. Not typically how you see that turn out and how you see that pan out. Mars Hill, though, I think a lot of question marks going into this year. The best thing about Week 0 is those things get answered rather quickly. I'm really excited about this one. I think this Delta State offense picks up right where they left off with a couple new faces leading the charge, and uh, they're going to roll heading into Gulf South Conference play. But, boom! I feel like I haven't taken a breath the entire time I've been recording this, about like 25 minutes in. That's how excited I am for D2 football. I'm sorry for a little bit of the hiatus. Glad to be back tonight. Thank you all for tuning in very much. Please let me know what you want to see from us this season. I'm always open to your guys' ideas and uh, what other kind of coverage you want when it comes to D2 football. I am uh, very appreciative to continue, continue excuse me, doing this show. For D1 Rejects, I've been Kobe Manzo.